We have enjoyed throughout our stay our bonds of African fraternity and solidarity continue to grow stronger and deeper. The Pan-African Parliament is a critical organ of the Africa Union whose full institutional potential is going to become manifest as we rally to formulate effective and sustainable solutions to the tremendous cries confronting our people and humanity in general. This parliament rises higher and goes further than the sum of its legislative representative and oversight mandate for Africa. It provides a fundamental deliberative forum where the peoples of Africa gather to reason exhaustively together and develop African solutions to Africa's problems. This assembly is the august crucible where the full range of African voices, the diversity of African ideas, and the variety of African insights interact and generate the principles and knowledge that we need to inform our endeavors to give present and future generations a prosperous and a secure Africa together with a livable planet. I therefore congratulate all of you for the confidence you have clearly inspired to be chosen as the African people's representatives in this parliament. You take your seats in this house at a very critical time for Africa and the world. The world is presently confronted with a daunting array of multifaceted challenges, which range from the pandemic recovery to the existential threat of climate change. There is also the prevailing adverse financial environment characterized by increasing interest rates and looming debt distress affecting Africa and the many other regions, not forgetting the complex security implications of a delicate geopolitical crisis. At this time, your leadership as members of this House is more vital than ever to guide and support all other institutions of the African Union in pursuit of a new, ambitious, and inspiring vision. It is a time to be bold, to be strong and resolute, enough to confront these challenges with greater unity and greater commitment. It is time to extend our forefathers' Pan-African dream into a brave new world in order to bequeath the people of Africa and our future generations a much better, more secure, and prosperous Africa that plays its role. And we are the continent of young people, hungry for better life and a clear role in the world affairs. Unfortunately, however, the discussive profile of the continent has too often been focused on the challenges and the difficulties we face and the assistance we need in a way that depicts us as chronically subordinate, eternally vulnerable, and perpetually incapable. As a consequence, an emerging psychology of victimhood implicates both African and global leadership in a politics of pity and helplessness. It also denies the world's youngest continent, repository of unparalleled abundance, the agency to articulate appropriate solutions for its own problems and to offer its unique, indispensable contribution on the broader global stage. 
I am persuaded that our generation of African leaders has the historic mandate to retire this unhelpful profile and in its place articulate a more accurate and compelling portrait of Africa that is both faithful to fact, yet also developmentally inspirational. <clears throat> Through this fundamental shift, we have the opportunity to empower and mobilize our people to drive transformation, attract investment, and inspire partnerships and collaborations across the world. I see a tremendously decisive role for yourselves as members of the Pan-African Parliament since you represent the voices of Africans on all issues pertaining to every sphere and sector of individual and collective endeavor. Please don't let us down. The need to urgently undertake fundamental shift in understanding Africa's global role is overwhelming evidence on the subject of climate change. At the moment, conversations about climate change in Africa focus on the fact that Africa's contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions is minimal at between 3 and 4 percent, yet the impact of Con or consequent climate change on our people is huge. This discourse also mainly focuses on the questions of compensation for loss and damage and funding for adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. This focus on matters that are clearly urgent tend to dominate and obscure the equally imperative matter of radical economic transformation. I consider rapid economic growth to be indispensable to the achievement of stable and dignified livelihoods for all, as well as the creation of lasting resilience. At the same time, I worry about the mainstream perspective where prosperity is often regarded ironically, as incompatible with environmental sustainability and relegated to the margins of global agenda for Africa. I will explain this a bit later. As a matter of fact, many Africa's global partners evasively scat around this necessary conversation, making it difficult and uncomfortable. Explicitly, and implicitly, they encourage Africa to focus on managing the consequences of climate change. Since only others in the global north are understood to possess the capacity to, sol to solve the global problems of such character and magnitude. This unjust dynamic is unnecessary, inappropriate, and only serves to hold us back from fulfilling our potential. Good people, let me ask you, who said that Africa cannot be part of the solution? That when Africa is being discussed, it's only being discussed in the context of the problems And our voices, our voices are limited to, oh no, you are victims of climate change. We will help you to manage the uh, situation. We will manage you to deal with adaptation. We will look for some little money for mitigation. We do not want to be in that corner. We want to be in the conversation about the solutions. And we have what it takes. And shortly, I will be proposing to you why I consider that, in fact,
The reason why we have been in a circus for all these years, it's because we as Africans have not stepped forward with our capabilities to provide the solution to this challenge of climate change. As the chair of the Committee of African Heads of State and Governments on Climate Change, I fully associate myself with the consensus that has evolved among Africa's leaders who have refused to be tethered to this unsatisfactory ideology. Instead, we have been pushing a fresh, affirmative, and solution-oriented perspective. And I have come here today to ask you to join us in executing this change of course, articulating a fundamentally pan-African principle and amplifying new ethos that summons the world to live, produce, and consume in harmony with nature that will be spearheaded by Africa. The single most important priority commitment that will propel Africa to lasting security, sustainable stability, and shared prosperity is an opportunity-oriented focus on climate change. Our continent's abundant health, wealth of natural resources, immense endowments of untapped green renewable energy, our youthful Democratic, uh, demographic profile, and our increasingly enlarging market precisely constitute the fundamental elements required to mitigate and then reverse climate change while driving a new green industrial revolution. Africa's untapped renewable energy let me give you some numbers. Africa's untapped renewable energy potential is more than 50 times the world's cumulative demand by 2030. The continent's untapped solar, wind, and geothermal potential is rated as super abundant in most African countries, meaning the potential is over 1,000 times the current demand. Yet, nearly 600 million Africans lack access to electricity, while another 150 million have highly unreliable access, and a whopping 900 million Africans have no access to clean cooking energy. Just imagine the paradox that we are in the middle of plenty while living in scarcity. The primary cause of Africa's minimal investment in, in, its, in exploiting its abundant green energy potential is the lack of energy intense anchor demand. Such demand would make investment in additional energy generation capacity bankable and render universal energy access possible. Scientists tell us that achieving the net zero emissions by 2050 is imperative to sustain human civilization. Failure to reach this target will lead to devastating and irreversible, irreversible impacts on ecosystems, weather patterns, and sea levels. At present rates, it will be extremely difficult if not altogether impossible for the world's industrial nations and fast growing emerging economies to achieve net zero goals on time. The only way for the world to achieve this net zero aspiration by 2050 is for countries which presently have net negative emissions as we do in most of Africa. And I, and I really want you to listen to me on this point, because this is the turning point. 
the only way for the world to achieve the net zero aspiration by 2050 is for countries which presently have net negative emissions, as we do in most of Africa, to make up for those on course to missing the 2050 goal. The implication of this scenario is that African countries are uniquely positioned to limit own emissions <coughs> and at the same time contribute reductions everywhere. We are not only in a position that we can limit our own emissions, but we can assist others. We can contribute to the reduction by others. The opportunity therefore exists to provide energy access for all Africans by 2030, while reducing total emissions from energy generation by creating green industrial capacity in Africa thus positioning the continent to support the global net zero ambition. The clearest path is to relocate global industrial production capacity to Africa and therefore meet Africa's as well as world's growing demand for goods and services. Let me take that again so that we are clear. The clearest path available to humanity, not just to us, available to humanity, is to relocate global industrial production capacity to Africa, and therefore meet Africa's as well as the world's growing demand for goods and services in a green fast manner that also enables the continent to leapfrog the industrial development path taken by the Global North. An African green industrial capacity will not only serve global demand, but it will also decarbonize global production, thereby fulfilling humanity's most ambitious climate goals. This is the very honest conversation we want to have. We are saying we can have a win-win in this engagement. We do not have to engage in the usual finger pointing. You caused this, you did not cause that. That's all fine. We contributed the least, that's fine. We are suffering the most, that's okay. But we can together agree on a solution that carries everybody. And that is the proposition we are having as the leadership of this continent. We are not selfish. We are willing to share, to present our resources so that we can not only solve our problem, but we can solve the global problem of climate change. Let me tell you more. For the first time in history, low or no emission production processes for products like steel, fertilizer, and hydrogen are technically feasible and economically efficient thanks to Africa's abundant renewable energy potential. Moreover, Primary processes of essential ores present a major opportunity for Africa to effectively balance its energy and climate ambition. Africa has 30 to 40 percent of the world's minerals, including those on which the green energy transition depends. The availability of these significant deposits makes a compelling case for Africa to be a global hub for manufacturing. For example, the simple decision to process the 80 million tons of iron ore annually exported by Africa to Europe and China and to process steel from plants close to mines in Africa averts the emission of nearly 7 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent 
in just one year. Processing over 110 million tons of bauxite exported annually from Africa to Europe and Asia at aluminum factories near the mines using renewable energy can also avoid between 1.3 and 1.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year, which is 3% of all global house gas emissions. What am I saying? I am saying instead of exporting the iron ores and the bauxite to be processed in Europe and China, if the decision was reversed so that we still get the same steel, but this time around, it is processed in Africa. You don't have to transport the ores. Use the renewable energy in Africa instead of the fossil fuel and, and uh, uh, um, uh, carbon energy in, in Europe. It is a simple decision. We will still get the steel for everybody. But let's change the paradigm. Instead of transporting iron ore and engaging in huge footprints of carbon, let us process the iron ores and the bauxite in Africa. And we are willing. Once it is processed in Africa, we will sell the steel to our friends. We will do two things. We will have created jobs in our continent. We will have done green for everybody, green industrialization for everybody. We will have reduced emissions for everybody. And we will have contributed to solving this big equation of carbon emissions. It is as simple as that. It is just as simple as that. You don't need any rocket science to, it is just as, as simple as, as, as it gets. Let me give you an example from Kenya. Kenya is a perfect case in point. Our comparatively small national grid is about three gigawatts, but consists of 92% renewable energy. We aspire to make our grid 100% renewable by 2030, in the next eight years, while executing a quantum leap in grid size to 100 gigawatts and 100% renewable by 2040. The small grid size and relatively high energy cost, production cost, that is, is in the past made it hard to attract energy intense industry to Kenya by recognizing the need to develop industrial anchor demand and shaping our plans accordingly, we have prioritized green industrialization and now aim to make carbon credits one of Kenya's biggest export products. In a month, we will have uh, con completed the institutional and legal framework for us to access manage and participate in the carbon market space. For the record, all the carbon trading in the African continent, let me say 25% at the moment is happening in Kenya. I want to encourage, I want to encourage us as a continent that that is the future. And the legislators here from different parliaments in our continent must carry this back home. To support this, we are working on the appropriate institutional framework to anchor carbon market regulation, align fiscal incentives, and a green investor-friendly environment that ensures communities benefit as businesses also flourish. We are therefore organizing and building our internal government capacity accordingly. And I dare say every other government, every other parliament must begin to internalize and to work along this line. The same 
will be true for our food production. As the world embraces regenerative agriculture, we recognize that our agricultural practices largely comply with a new approach. We must therefore commit to apply productive technologies driven by renewable energy, such as solar power irrigation, along with resilient seed varieties to increase our yields and farming in climate smart ways to generate soil health and additional carbon revenues. It is essential to point out the additional benefits of relocating industrial production to Africa in terms of strengthening our balance of trade, ease pressure on our currencies, and mitigating the vulnerability arising out of dependency on capricious supply chains, as is the case in our fertilizer supply. Case in point is what happened in Ukraine and Russia. We have all it takes to grow our industries and make Africa the clean, green factory of the world. My call today is for us to do so in a way that is green from the start so as to capitalize on the exclusive competitive advantage we have. No other continent has the advantage that we have as a continent. Another major opportunity for the continent is in carbon removal using hybrid solutions, including nature-based and technological solutions. Our continent has the potential to remove over 300 million tons of CO2 per year through nature-based solutions such as landscape restoration, reforestation, and mangrove forest protection and expansion. These measures, at a carbon price of US dollars 50 per ton, could provide in excess of 15 billion US dollars in revenue, create more than 85 million jobs, and improve millions of livelihoods. Of course, I am well aware that the prices we currently get on average are US dollars five per ton. It is unacceptably unfair given that everywhere else, prices go up to between 100 and 200 US dollars per ton. That's the conversation we need to have. We need a carbon market that has integrity. And this way, we wouldn't be asking for money for debt. We wouldn't be asking for debt relief. We wouldn't be begging for uh, grants and aid. We will be making a positive contribution to humanity and earning out of the assets of our continent. <laughs> Regarding engineered solutions, Kenya startups are exploring the use of the Rift Valley geo geological formations for mineralized storage <coughs> to replicate the success reported elsewhere in geologically comparable landscapes, such as in the Iceland. If you can generate carbon credits in Iceland, we can also generate carbon credits from the fissures in the Rift Valley. Market and market access are issues of cardinal significance as we articulate growth strategies centered on green development opportunities in our continent, we must also establish enabling policies and regulations that foster incentives to make Africa an attractive destination for the growing pool of global capital seeking climate positive opportunities. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is a major step in the right direction to the extent that it it seeks to enhance trade within the continent and presents the continent as one large trading area. It is absolutely essential to set up a sound global regime of trade and market with robust incentives for low emission production of goods and services with lower emissions. Such a framework would position Africa 
as the world's most competitive industrial investment and trade destination. I wish to direct your energy, your attention, sorry, to the European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism and the potential negative impact it will have on African exports. I hope some of you are aware of this mechanism. Our exports are produced in older and smaller industrial facilities that are not managed to minimize emissions compared to their European counterparts. The EU's mechanism is transmitting the most emphatic demand signal and lays down a set of incentives that make low emission production competitive. This is exactly what Africa can offer through transition. Instead of looking at it as a barrier, we should change it and make it a bridge. We have a responsibility to ensure that global carbon markets maintain the highest standards of integrity to most efficiently channel benefits and rewards to communities that do the hard work of protecting and expanding carbon sinks or innovating new ways to avoid or permanently remove greenhouse gases. Our international partners must provide market access and make the right, uh, the right kind of capital available to invest in our potential. On finance and capital, at the Paris Agreement, as well as earlier in Copenhagen in 2009, it had been agreed that developed countries would make available US dollars 100 billion every year for developing countries. Disappointingly, as expected, the amount has never materialized. As a result, this figure has become increasingly contentious and divisive in every other conference. By contrast, I invite you to consider the Global Finance Alliance for Net Zero, which was launched in COP26 in Glasgow. The alliance unites nearly 600 financial institutions. And I'm told there is a good gentleman who has made a presentation to us from the European Union. The alliance unites nearly 600 financial institutions who have jointly invested US dollars 4 billion in energy transition towards net zero, an amount that African investment opportunities we've hardly had tapped into. This variety of capital that is out in search of green investment opportunities is tapping into a rapidly growing global demand. Other regions appreciate this opportunity and are charging ahead. For example, the United States Inflation Reduction Act provides nearly 370 billion in tax incentives and government spending towards clean energy and climate technology. The EU has made US dollars 1 trillion available for the European Green Deal over and above new trade rules under the carbon border adjustment mechanism that make importers pay for the embedded carbon in their products. The planet simply cannot afford to channel a paltry 0.6% of, renew of renewable investment in Africa at a time when the continent is home to over 40% of the planet's best renewable energy resources. Our statistics on sustainability, efficiency, and green compliance are outstanding. I mentioned earlier that we can create energy access for all by 2030 while reducing total emissions related to energy generation by at least 80% and emissions per megawatt hour by well over 90% with only 30% investment. However, it entails a 40% higher upfront investment than the current policy pathway. If Africa is to be the green industrial powerhouse of the world, and there is no foreseeable alternative, much more investment has to be made available collectively 
by humanity. This position aligns very closely with the ongoing discussion in Bridgetown Initiative, which I am sure many of you are aware, whose principles, achievements, and aspirations we must applaud a decision in line with the bridge down core for action to channel a greater proportion of global finance to emerging and frontier economies and link it closely with climate action would make necessary concessional capital available to de-risk and attract private investment. This is pre precisely the outcome that decades of economic distress and underdevelopment of the Global South deserves and must have. Moreover, as the global financial reform movement considers debt restructuring, the sustainability of debt relief is a major shared concern. Many of the countries in debt distress benefited from debt relief according to the highly indebted Boer countries in the 90s. It is clear, therefore, that debt relief did not automatically usher in significant economic growth. In fact, it didn't achieve much. To liberate economies from this vicious cycle, positive growth that is sensitive to climate and biodiversity agenda is needed. This is growth that builds on all our assets. African countries possess inherent competitive potential to emerge as clean, green, global manufacturing hubs. And that's the unique position we have. Instead of all the games being played, all we need to do, we are telling the world, we have our assets, we are willing to have a win-win engagement. We have the largest green energy potential resources. The world has no choice. We cannot continue the fossil fuel fired industrialization. It has to change. All we are saying is we are coming with our assets, come with investment and technology. We meet halfway and everybody wins. That's all we are saying. We are tired of complaining. We are tired of being victims. We want to be part of the solution. Don't consign Africa to the margins of problems and being victims and managing adaptation. We have better proposals that can get all of us out of the quagmire that we are all in. A critical growth opportunity that can be the starting point for our intentional efforts in pursuit of our aspiration is fiscal space arising from both debt restructuring and blended capital, combined with economic growth that increases tax revenues and positions African countries to invest more in adaptation and resilience. Once we are once we have a win-win, once we are making money, once we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are engaged in economic activity, we can take care of the adaptation. We can take care of resilience. Don't bring resilience into the equation to fool anybody that we are going to get anywhere with money for adaptation. You know, we are managing a problem. We want to be part of the solution. Don't consign us to managing a problem. I submit to you in this esteemed assembly, my good friends, that by taking these measures with a degree of both urgency and resolve, Africa's leaders can energize our economies and inspire the people with a new vision centered on investment and growth, which is in harmony with our planet. In doing so, our generation will have discharged a tremendous historic developmental mandate, 
while realizing our common global ambition to arrest and ultimately reverse climate change. We will also make it possible for our economies to meet the needs and fulfill the hopes of a young workforce which grows at an annual rate of about 30 million young people in our continent, requiring us to generate millions of decent jobs every year. Your work, honorable members, therefore, is clearly cut out and your assignment very well defined. By facilitating robust and continuous discourse on the broadest cross-section of Africa, this parliament will simultaneously employ the federative transmission of ideas from discrete grassroots agencies to the global and continental multilateral <laughs> and intergovernmental fora, and at the same time engage the devolutionary mechanisms of domesticating global standards and international norms. Although the theme of this session is the African continent at crossroads, our discussion has enlarged our field of deliberation to encapsulate possibilities that transcend our defining dilemma of past decades. For a while, Africa has struggled with an implied trade-off between economic growth and prosperity on one hand and environmental sustainability on the other. We can now agree that given the transitional imperative, it is possible for Africa to execute clean, green industrialization that can enable the rest of the world attain the net zero target as well. We finally have the answer to the dilemma and with it, our way out of the thematic crossroads. In sim uh, simply, Africa is the answer. We don't have to be at the crossroads. If Africa is indeed the young green continent of the future and the locus of the next industrial revolution, Africa's solutions are no longer restricted to Africa's problems. They also address humanity's problems effectively, global problems <coughs> effectively. So we can confidently say that African solutions can actually provide global solutions. Cool. Aspirations often come with a problem of implementation. The concept paper contains a statement that I approved unreservedly. A sound policy framework should begin with formulation and end with implementation. But worldwide policy development is frequently prioritized without regard for performance. Our development partners tend to focus more on providing resources for policy development rather than implementing the policies. This situation has resulted in heaps of policy documents gathering clouds of dust on the shelves of government offices. As legislators, you are mandated not only to formulate law and policy, but also to rigorously oversee their implementation, to ensure that the Africa Union performs at the level of its aspirations, it will be necessary for you as legislators, representatives, and overseers to make sure that it empowers itself with sufficient capacity. Otherwise, African Solutions, Agenda 2063, the African Continental Free Trade Area, and the young, clean, green continent of the future will remain a mere pipe dream. I want to persuade you the power you enjoy today is delegated to you. The authority you enjoy today is delegated to you by the people of our continent. And let me remind you that the authority that you wield comes with responsibility. And responsibility comes with accountability. 
our Africa Union, we have to rethink the architecture, the governance structure of our Africa Union. This, this parliament, this parliament must provide the accountability mechanisms to make sure that all the structures of the Africa Union ultimately are answerable to the people of this continent. It is completely against the principles of accountability to have an important parliament. A parliament that cannot approve the budget of our organization. A parliament that cannot hold to account the executives in our administration is not the kind of parliament the people of Africa envisaged, is not the kind of parliament our forefathers envisaged when constituting our union. Let me also say the following, that as nations, the whole reform agenda around the AU is a necessary imperative. It is not possible for us as states, as governments, to hold all the power and expect the African Union to function. We must be courageous enough, we must be bold enough to delegate some of the powers of our nations to the collective body of the Africa Union. That is what other progressive unions have done. It is not possible for us to continue to engage with the rest of the world the way we are doing. The budget of Africa Union, to a good extent, is funded by development partners. What does it say about our ability to make our own decisions? It is said, he who pays the piper calls the tune. As things stand today, and I say this with tremendous respect, the Africa Commission Chair, the Africa Union Commission Chair, does not have what it takes to prosecute the agenda for our continent. We still hold all the power as heads of state and expect the union to function. It cannot function. We have to donate some of the power to the collective authority of the union. I had occasion, let me explain to you something. I had occasion a few weeks ago to talk with a German chancellor. And he was explaining to me how Germany has donated matters trade, matters investment, to the European Union. And they have immensely benefited by working together as 27 governments, 475 million people. In our continent, we still want to keep all the powers in our little corners. How are we going to negotiate with EU as a country? You know, how are you going to negotiate? And this is the candid conversation we must have. The Africa, the Pan-African Parliament must operate at the same level as the European Parliament. If we have, if we have to engage with the European Union 
on a platform as equals. How does a country with 10, 20 million people engage with the European Union with 400 million, uh, five, four, 500 million people on equal footing? Is that a reality? You know, we, we just must be honest to ourselves. The globe is acting in concert. We cannot afford not to act together. Good people, this is my request to you. And our organization must begin to internalize accountability. If you want to wield power, if you want to wield authority, you must be ready to be held to account. Otherwise, you have no business. And the organization to hold the African Union to account is this parliament. So what am I saying? For example, let me give you another example. We have been to US Africa. We have been to uh, some other engagement with other countries. Now we have been invited for a uh, Russia-Africa summit. We have made a decision very respectfully as heads of state in Africa that any engagement with other partners must be an engagement of equals. And for it to be meaningful, for it to be meaningful, if we are going to meet the president of a country, we have organized ourselves that the Troika is going to represent Africa. The chair, the current chair, the past chair, the chair that is coming, and the heads of our uh, regional economic uh, commissions, about six, seven people. But what happens continuously? When others want to engage with us, they don't want to deal with the Troika. They want to invite 50 heads of state. <laughs> so we go to a meeting, just explain to me what kind of outcome you expect where 50 heads of state are sitting. Everybody is asked to speak to one and a half minutes. You speak to one, for one and a half minutes. What kind of engagement are you going to get? You're going to get nothing, right? The best that you get is photographs. <laughs> Precisely, you get these photographs. Uh, they, they normally line us up somewhere, you know, <laughs> crowd of uh, 50 heads of state. You know, and that's all we come, we come home with, you know, because there isn't time to engage. Any serious, uh, any serious country that wants to engage with Africa, yeah, must respect first our architecture. If we have said we are going to be represented by the Troika, why are you inviting 50 people unless you want to sabotage the whole discussion? <laughs> and if you can't respect our own rules, it is a sign of lack of goodwill. I mean, you must so that when we engage, you know, if, if we have a smaller group of five, ten, uh, five people, then you can have a meaningful conversation. And we can have a meeting of equals. But here you are, you represent two, three hundred million people. You have a guy here who represents ten people. You have another guy who represents ten million people. Then that conversation becomes, and some of the time, you know, the most unfortunate thing is that some of the people who invite us to these meetings tell us, if you don't come, there will be consequences. So, 
all of us are, are forced to go to a meeting <laughs> that has no meaningful outcome because of blackmail. This is not right, good people. You know, this, <laughs> this is not okay. You know? So, I have uh, written to my brother who was here the other day that this time round, any other invitation, it must respect the rules of our continent. We have said any meaningful engagement. Anybody who wants us to take them seriously, they must first respect our architecture. If they want a fruitful engagement, they should engage our continent in a manner that we can effectively represent our people and we can effectively discharge our mandate and articulate our issues, not in a crowd. We want, we want to be effective. We want to, we, want, we want to engage, you know? So if you are one head of state and you want to engage all these people, surely, are you sincere? You know, in, in engaging in a crowd? You, because some of these uh, good people, they want to avoid any commitments, you know? They, they want to avoid any meaningful engagement. They just want a baraza and uh, okay, okay, pictures, pictures, and then we go. Dinner, and then... I mean, good people, we have food in our countries, at least we can eat at home. The Africa Union reform agenda must therefore become a priority this session. And you must, members of parliament, you must interrogate and conduct the process to ensure that structurally the roles of the bureau, summit, committees, regional caucuses, secretariat, and commission are rationalized to give Africa a fit for purpose continental governing body worth its name. To do so, this Honorable Assembly must urgently review the funding arrangements to ensure that Africa Union budgets are financed primarily by members and secondarily by external partners. In turn, this will require a mechanism where Africa Union member states are up to date with their contributions with regard to all our commitments. As matters stand, our most core mandates depend on the goodwill of development partners. Just imagine, including critical peace and security matters, that our own peace and security fund is funded by development partners more than it's funded by us as heads of state and countries. Good people, this needs to change. Africa solutions must look like solutions. And in principle, they ought to emanate from us. How do we say we are providing African solutions if it is funded by development partners? It's a fallacy. It means we have no capacity to provide Africa solutions if it is being funded by others. A case in point, we have a situation in Sudan. The generals in Sudan are bombing everything. They are bombing roads, they are bombing uh, bridges, they are bombing hospitals, they are destroying airports, using military hardware bought by African money. Just imagine. We need to tell those generals to stop the nonsense. Yeah. Military capacity is for fighting criminals and terrorists. It is not for fighting children and women and destroying our own infrastructure. <laughs> but as it is, we have no capacity to stop this nonsense in our own continent. 
because our own peace and security fund is funded by others. We have a problem. <laughs> but I'm, tell I'm telling you, we are going to correct this problem. It is us to do it. Let me also um, tell you that uh, I think we're going to have a new, and, and we need your help. You know, we need your support. You must take up your role, you know? You must take up your role and make sure that our executives, the people running the Africa Union, are held to account. With this vision in mind, I sought and was privileged to receive the approval of the African Heads of State and Government Summit to have the honor of hosting the Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi this year in September. This will be a major gathering of African and global leaders to deliberate and consolidate a clear African position and clear African voice as we project our agenda in the global stock take engagements and the build up to COP28. The summit also provides an opportunity to highlight and forge consensus on the modalities of unlocking Africa's vast potential to positively impact the climate agenda and rally the world to tap into the numerous opportunities that Africa presents towards global net zero. This will not be another morning uh, summit where we are uh, mourning about our situation. We are going to boldly tell the world we will contribute positively to a solution and we have what it takes. I invite you all to Nairobi to join us at that summit and to take part in that broader journey and vision for Africa to hold meaningful discussions with global partners. I have told you Africa heads of state and governments have resolved that partnership summits by external parties shall be reviewed with a view to providing an effective framework for African Union partnerships. And we are going to work together in that, uh, in that manner. Another proposition I want to make to you is the United Nations. This is an important forum for transacting global affairs in diplomacy, peace, security, and trade, among others. But Africa, a continent of 1.2 billion people and a GDP of close to $2 trillion, finds itself disadvantaged by the current configuration of the UN, General, of the UN Security Council, a configuration that was established 80 years ago before the Second World War. But the world has since changed tremendously, we all know. Countries that had not become self-determining have since attained independence and are making a huge contribution to their people, continents, and the world. It is therefore time to reform the UN Security Council and change it from an exclusive club of five permanent members to a more representative global council that works for the interests of the whole world. We have said Africa must have, at the minimum, two permanent seats at the Security Council. Yes. And by the way, we are being very modest. Yeah, we are being very modest because we are understanding. We must, we must therefore work together to make our continent prosperous for that for that is what it deserves, and our people now and generations to come, and improve our relations with global business and global investments. One final thing uh, that I want to, I know uh, many of you have talked about Paris. Yes, we will be going to Paris, because we want to occupy every space we are going to be consistent. We are going to be coherent. We are going to be audible. 
until there is no place to hide. Yeah. Until the conferences are stopped. Otherwise, we will make them noisy. We will make them messy. And there will be, and there will be consequences. <laughs> if we are not hard. We are refusing to stay on the margins anymore. Yeah? We want to be at the table. Because we are told the risk, the risk of not being at the table is that you could be in the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> So we are going to occupy every space. And we have been gentlemen for far too long. We are now going to appropriate our place because we have a contribution to make. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. I don't take it for granted. And God bless you. to say. I have nothing to say. Hey! Hey, 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 Your Excellency. Your Excellency. I am standing here saying, what can I say? <laughs> nothing but to just thank you, nothing more. Nothing. Just thank you. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Yeah. At one point, I could see 80% seated and wondering, looking at you like this. <laughs> wondering whether this is coming from a president of this continent. People have always wanted to hear what you say, but they don't hear it. You know, you, you spoke as if you were this side, not this side. <laughs> look, 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 look. You have propelled Africa to another higher level. I tell you, we now have gained confidence in our leadership on this continent. We really have confidence. We now have hope. And those that are aspiring, because this parliament has produced, as we said yesterday, 
a number of heads of state from this parliament. The current president of Seychelles was here two years ago. The current president of Namibia was a member of this parliament. Former president Mahama of Ghana was a member of this parliament. Former president of Mali, Keita, was a member of this parliament. Who else? So, now today, Niger president. Niger. Niger, Bazoum, Honor Bazoum. He used to sit over there, there, that side. Bazoum, former member of this parliament. But I want to say, if there are others among you who are also aspiring, I think think twice. It is no longer the presidents of yesterday. Things have changed. Look, we now want this caliber. <laughs> this is the caliber now we are looking for. So you may have to withdraw your candidature. <laughs> anyway, if you listen the property, and I, all of you listen. This can be a speech, a talk, but in my language of academic life, this is not a speech. It is a treatise, a treatise which lives forever, treatise.